Hi, and welcome to He Has Answers, a completely free online ministry resource that, while still very much under construction, contains more than enough information to help you come to know the God who made you, knows you, loves you, and whom wants you to come and know Him so you may be saved and have everlasting life. In this series of videos, we'll be reading through a downloadable PDF file of an unfinished free ebook titled, He Is, The Truth That God Exists, and the Thorough Investigation of Undeniable Proofs, so that you can see that beyond a reasonable doubt, God is real and the Holy Bible is His Word. If you'd like a copy of this PDF file for yourself, it can be downloaded here by right-clicking this link and saving the link as is in a folder on your own personal computer or even in your mobile device. Now let's begin. Let's pray. God, please give me a soft and humble heart as I listen. Please open my eyes and my ears and change my spirit so I may know you and worship you in spirit and in truth. Now let us continue with part four. The Bible is the revealed word of God. Items for temple worship. They shall enter my sanctuary, and they shall approach my table to minister to me, and shall keep my charge. When they enter the gates of the inner court, they shall wear linen garments. They shall have nothing of wool on them while they minister at the gates of the inner court and within. The book of Ezekiel chapter 44 verses 16 and 17. It should be understood, dear friend, that Ezekiel is being led to prophesy about conditions that will be met during the millennial reign of Christ in the millennial temple, and not any temple being made by man. Nevertheless, many Jews believe a third temple will soon be built. In order to commence with the Levitical rituals of old, different organizations are preparing in advance. The Temple Institute and Temple Mount and Land of Israel Faithful Movement are two such groups. They've crafted dozens of items and garments for use in this temple while also working to educate and lobby for the release of the Temple Mount so that construction of the third temple can begin. For anyone wondering, the claims from Muslims that the Mount belongs not to the Jew, but to them, are entirely false. The assertion stems from the erroneous belief that Abraham built the Al-Aqsa Mosque 3,000 years ago, and Muhammad, the false prophet, ascended to heaven from the very spot the Dome of the Rock was erected. Yet in 1927, following an earthquake, which damaged the mosque and uncovered its foundation, a British archaeologist named Robert Hamilton examined the exposed area and discovered a mikvah a ritual pool used for spiritual cleansing from the Second Temple period. It would have been used by Jews who were purifying themselves before going into the temple, and it was certainly built before the mosque. Muslims have once more been conned by their own religious leaders. This should be surprise no excuse me, this should surprise no one considering the Quran is a counterfeit holy book filled with ripped off material from the Old Testament. So then who does Mount Zion really belong to? It should be obvious. One of the more incredible and notable items is the anointing oil used to anoint both the temple and the priests. The Lord said to Moses, Take the finest spices of liquid myrrh, 500 shekels, and of sweet-smelling cinnamon, half as much, that is, 250, and 250 of aromatic cane, and 500 of cassia, according to the shekel of the sanctuary, and a hin of olive oil, and you shall make of these a sacred anointing oil, blended as by the perfumer. It shall be a holy anointing oil. The book of Exodus chapter 30, verses 23 to 25. Unfortunately, the anointing oil and the ingredients were lost in antiquity, presumably when the Romans destroyed the Second Temple in 70 AD. Her Aunt Jeffrey makes the claim in one of his books that the last remaining groves of afarsmen or sweet-smelling cinnamon, were burnt up at this time by Jews wanting to keep it out of the hands of Rome. Being honest as usual while writing this, I haven't been able to find any evidence regarding this. Although Josephus does say a great deal of spices including cinnamon were confiscated for Emperor Titus at this point in history. However, what can apparently no longer be identified in today's markets is the liquid myrrh. Whatever the case may be, the anointing oil the Israelites once used was lost long ago. With no absolute certainty of how to concoct it again, how would the Jews go about dedicating a third temple, or even the priests to operate it for that matter? 
In 1952, not long after God brought Israel back into the land, an archaeologist found a scroll made from copper among the Dead Sea Scrolls in Cave 3. It would be catalogued as 3Q15. On it was a list of hidden items and their whereabouts. The script was dated through orthography and paleography to between 50 to 100 AD, of no coincidence, the same era the temple came down. It would seem fairly clear this treasure map of sorts was put together by Jews anticipating the terrible actions at the hands of the Romans, and they did so on a material meant to last longer than any of the papyrus scrolls, just in case. Some, however, believe the scroll originated in the days of Jeremiah before the first temple was destroyed. In 1988, a Texan Bible believer named Vendel Jones discovered a small 5-inch juglet using his own translated details from the copper scroll. The small jug was found buried in Qumran's Cave 13 and contained a thick oil. After intensive testing by the pharmaceutical department of Hebrew University, it was determined to contain the very ingredients of the oil believed necessary for dedicating a new temple and its caretakers. If that wasn't incredible enough, four years later Vendel's team, again using the Copper Scroll, would also find huge stores of the temple incense used with daily sacrifices. 800 pounds, in fact. Dr. Marvin Antelman with the Weizmann Institute in Yachav Arkin at the Israel Institute of Geology agreed that the sample they received from Vendel contained at least eight of the eleven spice ingredients for the Hekhotoret as listed in the Mishnah. The Torah, on, excuse me, the Torah notes only four ingredients. More exhaustive testing by Dr. Terry Hutter, a paleobotanist, found that the compound contained not only the eight ingredients, but nine different and unique plants recognized by the pollen and organic maceral types. Naturally, all of these items, whether they've been discovered or remanufactured, point to the same necessity. A third temple needs to be built for them to be put to use. We started this segment by looking at a passage from a series of prophetic chapters Ezekiel wrote out. Most Jewish scholars recognize from the text that this temple Ezekiel speaks of must be supernaturally manifested, many believing with the appearance of their Messiah. To that, they're probably correct. This would be a reference to the true coming millennial temple, a fourth temple. But as we saw with the Temple Institute and similar organizations, there is the view that the next temple will be built by man. As already alluded to, with the Dome of the Rock and the Al-Aqsa Mosque present on the Temple Mount, serving as what some consider Islam's third holiest site, it's going to take a lot of negotiating to make this a reality, as Israel's archaeologically proven historical right to the hill has done little to sway the Islamic authorities. Some believe the Dome of the Rock would need to be destroyed for the temple to be erected, as the dome is apparently where the temple once stood. Others believe the temple must be exactly where it once stood, because the Holy of Holies cannot be placed in any location other than where it originally was, not off even by a few feet. This seems silly to me, as the tabernacle of cloth and skins was marched all over the wilderness under Moses, but maybe this has something to do with the understanding that only the Messiah can build the temple. Yet, others offer that the temple could be built beside the Dome of the Rock, or that it actually was originally built just north of where the dome currently stands. One opinion of how all of this could get approved is through encouragement and even amicable pressure by world faith leaders, as if the Temple Mount could serve as an emblem of worldwide interfaith, hoping to bring peace and unity between all religiously founded people groups. David Gunn even wrote in his book, protecting Jerusalem's holy sites, a strategy for negotiating a sacred peace. Quote, Given the emphasis upon the international community's interest in the sites, under the concept of heritage of humankind, representatives from the international community need to be included as mediators and guarantors. These would likely come from the United Nations, UNESCO, and drawn from regional powers such as the Arab League, NATO, or interested states such as the U.S., the E.U., and Russia. Any proposed legal regime will require interfaith cooperation composed of religious leaders from the region. It may be supplemented by international religious leaders who may serve as mediators. End quote. Others are hopeful that President Donald Trump, who's proven himself rather favorable to the nation of Israel, and also prides himself as a world-class negotiator and author of The Art of the Deal, could be the very person to broker the agreement. Perhaps it would be in an exchange for a two-state solution? 
That should intrigue you, dear friend, as God has warned that scattering his people and dividing his land results in the day of the Lord, or his return and judgment of the nations. Conceivably, a two-state solution could be arrived at, initiating the Temple Mount, opening to the Jew for the rebuilding of the Temple, and this would kick off the final end-time events. The interfaith scenario is quite compelling when one recalls that the Antichrist will be worshipped via a one-world faith movement. How fitting if the epicenter of such worship was on Mount Zion, right where Christ has promised to rule earth from, no? Even more so when we understand that the Antichrist is foretold to sit in the third temple and announce that he is God. Those in the church who've sadly gotten their eschatology mixed up believe what is called the abomination of desolation already occurred pre-Christ. We'll talk about this later on in our discussion. That's because they don't understand that even the text makes it clear that such an early episode was only a foreshadowing of a much worse latter fulfillment. The Apostle Paul, who was most certainly post-Christ, confirms this for us in his second epistle to the Thessalonians. Let no one deceive you in any way, for that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first, and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. The second letter to the Thessalonians, chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. Kind of tough to allegorize that away. Paul is actually writing this portion because new believers had been deceived into believing the day of the Lord had already come. Again, having discernment and a proper understanding of eschatology is important to avoiding to avoid being misled. Based on God's complete word, we know a third temple is definitely on its way. Whether it's prepared in advance for the Antichrist, or it's the Antichrist himself who calls for its building while making the prophesied truce with the nation of Israel, as the end times begin, is anyone's guess. One way or another, the Antichrist will use the temple to commit the most outrageous blasphemy, naming himself as God over mankind. Who knows? Maybe the Antichrist will do this at the ribbon-cutting ceremony when the temple will be open to the entire world. Just after cutting the ribbon himself as the honored guest for paving the way for its construction, having just handed the scissors off to someone else. Obviously, if there is any attempt to build the third temple, especially if it involves the destruction of Islamic structure, it would most likely result in a massive war with several Arab nations ravaging Israel, intent on its final destruction. As stated a number of times now, God's word dictates that the world will indeed come against Israel before Christ returns to save them. If the third temple is built before the Antichrist brings peace, we will see many Arab nations unite to destroy Israel. This may be the very reason the Antichrist comes to the forefront, to peaceably settle the conflict, thus garnering adoration from the entire world. Or such a gathering of nations may include other nations foretold to come against God's people. The following passage from Asaph, or perhaps King David, shows one of these scenes taking place. O God, do not keep silence. Do not hold your peace or be still, O God. For behold, your enemies make an uproar. Those who hate you have raised their heads. They lay crafty plans against your people. They consult together against your treasured ones. They say, Come, let us wipe them out as a nation. Let the name of Israel be remembered no more. For they conspire with one accord. Against you they make a covenant. The tents of Edom and the Ishmaelites, Moab and the Hagrites, Gebel and Ammon and Amalek, Philistia with the inhabitants of Tyre, Asher also has joined them. They are the strong arm of the children of Lot, the 83rd Psalm, verses 1 to 8. Some scholars believe this psalm was written while David's kingdom was under threat. Others think it arose at that period, but in a prophetic manner. Some believe it was shortly before the fall of Jerusalem and the destruction of Solomon's temple. Some say it was fulfilled during the Arab-Israeli War of 1948, while others still say it came to fruition during the Six-Day War. There's elements of truth to all of these positions, but it should not be dismissed that this could very well be speaking of an end-time war. Yes, some of the ethnic groups or nations mentioned no longer exist in any semblance of prominence, but they all represent present-day lands and nations adjacent to Israel who've already proven that if provoked, would quickly pounce upon God's chosen people. In passing, I'll briefly mention that God warned Abraham's concubine Hagar, the mother of his son Ishmael, who was illegitimate in the eyes of God. He shall be a wild donkey of a man, his hand against everyone, and everyone's hand against him. 
and he shall dwell over against all his kingsmen. The book of Genesis, chapter 16, verses, verse 12. Being as Muslims insist, they are the collective offspring of Ishmael, and taking into account <clears throat> oh so wonderful groups like ISIS or Al-Qaeda or Hamas or a bevy of others that should justifiably be wiped off the face of the earth, is there, any really, is there really any doubt God was speaking from outside of time here? It's been 4,000 years since these words were uttered. It really is insane to see how all the pieces are falling into place for this end-time war against Israel. If you're keeping your finger on the pulse and your eyes open, you can see all the players God's word speaks about getting into position through alliances, treaties, the occupation of bases, and even the rapid building of highways and roadways capable of moving vast armies right to the plains of Megiddo, just as the Bible says. The plains of Megiddo are where we get the word Armageddon from. It's all happening so fast, too, as if the powers behind these nation-states are giddily following along in the scriptures, trying to bring about what's clearly laid out in the pages, just to see what will happen. Yet it's just as likely they're unwitting pawns in the whole drama as Satan riles them up to attack the children of God whom he hates while God sovereignly works it all together for the coming of Jesus Christ. Before we move on, I just want to say, whether you're not a believer or you profess to believe in Jesus as Lord already, if the Holy Bible prophesied that the Antichrist would begin to rule once he took a non-stop flight from Tuk to Yaktuk to Timbuktu, would you align yourself with Satan's pursuit of world domination by funding the creation of an airline whose sole aim was the operation of just such a route? No, of course you wouldn't if you were at all conscientious. Your desire would be to do the will of God, share the gospel, and evangelize while resisting the schemes of the devil, right? So then why are there so many Christian ministries trying to raise money and support for the rebuilding of the Jewish temple and the re-implementation of the sacrifices just so the Antichrist can enter it and proclaim that he is the promised Messiah of mankind meant to rule the world. Talk about playing into the devil's hand. Why support this third temple and its sacrifices which do not save? Along with that, why are people who say they love Jesus giving money to Jewish ministries that deny their Messiah and refuse to share the gospel with the Jews they are helping? Just because Genesis chapter 12 promises blessings for those who bless Israel doesn't mean you have to throw your money away at organizations intent on keeping people blinded from salvation. Do you really think they're telling the recipients, well, nice Christians help provide this because Jesus is their Christ and they love you? Doubtful. Sadly, some professing Christians don't understand their own scriptures and can't see that even as a Jewish blood descendant of Abraham, denying Christ results in eternal damnation. God's word is clear that no one is saved by their pedigree. Dr. Rez Seref of One for Israel stated the gut-wrenching statistics recently that evangelicals donate billions of dollars a year to Israel, but don't realize that less than 2% will go towards a ministry that will actually share the gospel. Oh, church, how is this possible if we love God's chosen people? Research who you're giving to. When you have a choice... Make sure your financial aid goes to help people accompanied by the good news of the Messiah. That goes for any charity or self-proclaimed ministry. Thanks for listening to this video, and I hope that it blesses you. Please do share it with others so they may have the opportunity to understand this incredible truth. Be blessed.